Welcome to the Functional Relations Podcast, where we set aside time to have engaging conversation. Are you drinking? Oh, is this a practice run? Yeah, can you hear that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a practice run. Oh, good. It's a practice run. Oh, uh, yeah? It didn't feel can, like I, a practice You run. can hear my drinking, though? Yeah, because the thing is, the microphone <laughs> is at your mouth, and you're drinking <laughs> in your yeah. mouth. Yeah, okay. Okay. Welcome to the Functional Relations Podcast, where we set aside time to have engaging conversation on relevant topics related to behavior analysis. I'm Zachary Bird. And I'm Caleb Davis. Zach, how's it going? Hey, man. Uh, it's going really well. This is season three of the podcast. I know. It's that? great. Episode oh, one of season three. We're back. It's unbelievable. I can't believe it. I feel like we haven't done this forever. <laughs> I know. It really has been a long time. But I'm glad that we're back at it. We have some, I think, some really cool ideas lined up for season three. Um, we decided that basically it would be on supervision. What does that mean? Yeah. So, right. Generally, this season is going to be all about topics related to supervision. Um, this episode specifically, we're, we're talking about how to be an effective supervisor, I think we're we're taking a pretty big bite this first uh, <laughs> this first episode. Yes. It's a pretty broad topic, but um, yeah, we're kind of hoping I think today to talk about what it takes. All, there's a lot that goes into being an effective supervisor, yeah. and I think there's certainly a lot to learn along the way. I've I've had the opportunity to supervise a number of trainees, and I I think that mm-hmm. I constantly am learning new things i'm refining what i do it's i think if you go into it with an open mind it can be it can be a really rewarding experience yeah i think that um one of the things about supervision is that when i've done it in the past i feel like it keeps me fresh like i learn it's not that i i don't learn that much i learn about how to work with people because i think that that's something i'm always learning and 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 getting better at hopefully, but I, it like keeps me fresh on my behavior analysis, like one-on-one sort of stuff, right? Like, Oh yeah. That's keeping, a good point. Keeping those track of those, like, you know, what's a stimulus prompt or whatever, those sorts of things. Like I forget that in like five minutes after. <laughs> so it's no, nice that, to have that. That's a good point. That is something I really like about supervision too, where there's definitely been times where a supervisee will ask me something and I'm just like, Gee, um, I'm going to look into that. And next time we meet, I'll have an answer for you. So it's good. It kind of makes sure that you're keeping your skills sharp. And that's right. Um, I think diving into those technical things that maybe you haven't thought about in a little while. Yeah. And that's that's a great thing. Um, but also it it keeps us humble, right? You know, it's one of those things where, you know, students who are thinking about this stuff a lot, they're going to classes, they're talking to their, their colleagues and they're thinking about it maybe for the first time, like all these topics that are so new and so interesting because it's a different way of thinking. They'll have a way of asking questions that's like, oh yeah, you know what? I haven't thought about that in a long time and I don't really know the answer. And it's just a humbling experience or like, it's something that I have thought about and I just still don't know the answer, right? And yeah, I, that's a nice thing about um, coming across students because they're really passionate and they care a lot and keeps you keeps you young, Caleb. You know what I mean? It keeps you young. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, you know, as we're talking about some of the questions that maybe we've been asked by supervisees, we're, we're kind of challenged by those. And I, I think that that's, like we're talking about, that's not a bad thing. Like if you're a new supervisor or something <laughs> and you're, you know, maybe you're a little nervous about supervising, not sure if you're up for it or not. Like it's all right if you don't know everything. I think that that's, you know, just part of the process. And even people yeah. that have been doing supervision for a while, I think they probably come across questions that, you know, you have to go take a look in the literature, maybe dust off the Cooper book, uh, <laughs> take a peek in there, but it's all right. And it's, and I think uh, actually that process is really valuable because you can teach people that if you don't know the answer, you know how to get the answer. 
right? Like you don't know the answer right now, or you can't remember the answer right now, but like you have a process, which is maybe I pop up in Cooper. This is how I look up Google with Google Scholar. This is how I, you know, ask a, another colleague of mine. Let me email, you know, someone that I know who knows the answer or whatever, right? Yep. There's a process, a problem solving process that's part of that that needs to be taught too, because that person in five years will be in the same situation. Their mind might not be as fresh on those topics, but they need to know how to find it. And that's like, I think that's a great skill. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess something I will ask you, Zach, is... Oh, great. What do you, generally, what do you think it takes to be an effective supervisor when you're training BACB trainees? Okay. I think, number one, I think you have to be friendly. Okay. I think you have to be, oh, you know, this actually reminds me. My um, PhD advisor, Dr. Phil Chase, do you remember, you took took some courses with him, Caleb, too, and he used to say, a good supervisor or a good advisor is, or I think he said a good teacher, right? Said, yeah, I remember it as teacher. Okay, a good which teacher. pretty much applies to everybody. Everybody is. Yeah, right. <laughs> everybody's a teacher in some ways. Firm, friendly, and fair. And that actually, that to me, that's what a good supervisor is. That's what a good leader is. Someone who's firm, friendly, and fair. Firm because you have some expectations, right? There's some things that you need to get accomplished. If this person's going to pass the exam, if this person's going to be a successful clinician, they have to accomplish things. And then friendly is like building that relationship. Someone is, you know, you have to be able to come across as a personable, even if you're not Caleb, even if you're not a personable person, you want to come across as a person. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> you got to come across as a personable person. So being friendly and then fair, which is that um, when you create contingencies, someone needs to understand clearly what's expected of them so that they don't feel like what you expected was different than what they were expecting and it comes across as actually fair. And so I think that those three are a good summary of what I think it is to be a good effective supervisor. I mean, I, it was a little bit of a cop out because I used someone else's example, but I, you know, everything I've learned is like that from someone else. So, Yeah, I actually love that you brought up that example. I hadn't thought about that in a little while, um, but I love that, that quote. And going back to what you said by firm, I think that firm doesn't mean mean. (laughs) No. no. Firm is like firm on what needs to be accomplished. It's like the goal. Goal That's the way I think about it is, you know, when somebody is learning to be a BCBA uh, or meet the requirements to be able to sit for their BCBA exam, we have like some really firm goals as far as this is what yeah. you got to be able to master to be able to do that. Like that's part of the the process. And so being firm on those goals, but I, I don't think necessarily being firm on how we're going to accomplish that. Not right? like harsh, I, right? Not that, harsh. Not harsh, but yeah. Well, so think of it this way, right? You could imagine a supervisor being someone who's very friendly, but because they're not firm, the person just doesn't pass the exam, Right. Like, like, there's just no expectations. Like, it's just like, hey, come in. We'll chat for an hour. We'll be friendly. And then when you leave, you don't know anything more than when you came in. And that's like, you know, you could imagine that happening. And so anyway, so I think that, that that's what we're trying to accomplish. In general, this season is going to be about this, the supervision. We call it the experience, right? It's the supervision experience because there's both from the supervisor's perspective, but also from the trainee's perspective. And we're going to go back and forth between these episodes. One episode of the supervisor, one episode from the trainee, and that'll be something that, um, could you explain a little bit about that before we jump into the um, interview about uh, that we have for effective supervision? Yeah, right. So the the episodes that are going to be more like our traditional episode format, which is what this episode is, Mm -hmm. um, is we're going to have an interview with somebody talk about what it, what it takes to be an effective supervisor, or I guess the skills that you need to have to be an effective supervisor. 
in this episode it'll be worth one supervision CE. Okay. Um, but then the other type of episode will be more geared towards students and those just learning um, about behavior analysis and maybe wanting some some content to supplement the other things they're doing to potentially study for the exam. Um, and so this is where you and I, Zach, will just kind of talk about some concepts and provide examples that hopefully the student listeners or just, you know, anybody who's interested in learning about those concepts will find valuable. Yeah. So this episode, one supervision CE, and uh, the topic is essentially a kind of a general thing about what are the components of being an effective supervisor. And so um, I gave you my opinion, Caleb, on what is an effective supervisor. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think I would add a little bit to that. So in addition to the three Fs, as we'll call it, uh, (laughs) uh, firm, fair, and friendly, I think it's also important to, to have a plan, like to to know how you're going to approach the supervision experience. Um, Because I do get the sense that there's some variability in our field in how or what supervision looks like. Um, Obviously, there's the requirement that you, you have these meetings with a supervisor and trainee, but what actually takes place in those meetings, I feel like there's a lot of variability potentially. Not that supervision has to look the same for everybody, Right. Actually, quite the opposite. I think you you probably want to <laughs> make sure it fits the needs of your your trainee. But I think regardless of what you end up doing, I think going into it with a plan, making sure that you have all the content covered, making sure that the trainee is able to master and have the opportunity to work and contact all the taskless items. And I think that can be really difficult, to be quite honest. Like there's a lot to get in. And I think if you don't have a plan, it's potentially an issue that you might not cover everything. And then that's not necessarily setting a a trainee up for a good experience. So that's my thought. I think in addition to what you said, Zach, just having a plan and that will allow you to sort of um, make sure somebody's meeting expectations and you can work on it together and discuss with them how it's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, okay, this is great. Well, I think this is a great first episode to get us started with this season. Episode one of season three of the Functional Relations Podcast. We are going to go find someone to talk about, in general, some topics related to what it means to be an effective supervisor. Are you ready to go do that? Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, Caleb, before we go into the interview, uh, I know we don't usually do this, but can I do an ad? Uh, sure. Okay. How would you like to wake up every morning with an email in your inbox from Dr. Zach Bird? Uh, I think it would depend on what it says. <laughs> well, maybe it's a list of things to do that day, or maybe it's a note of appreciation for being such a strong team member. Is this an ad for your company? <laughs> yeah, Caleb, it is. Yes. As the founder of Principal Behavior Consultants, I wanted to reach out to our listeners because we're looking to grow our team. The term principled was chosen for two reasons. One, it reminds us that the company sticks to the fundamentals of behavior and focuses on evidence-based treatment. And two, it suggests a high-integrity, values-oriented company with a commitment to ethics. We offer a competitive salary, full benefits, and get this. Because we are all consultants, you won't need to supervise direct care staff or RBTs. And if it works out, I'd be willing to offer a $5,000 relocation bonus. Wow. Uh, Sounds like a good company, actually. Thank you, Caleb. It is a good company. And we have the opportunity for a consultant in Roanoke, Virginia, where I live. I did visit a couple summers ago, and I can confirm that it's pretty nice. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Roanoke is an awesome city. It's surrounded by natural beauty, has a low cost of living, but was actually ranked number three in the list of 2018 best affordable places to live. 
We also have another consultant position in Blacksburg, Virginia, which also topped a list of the top 100 places to raise a family. It's just about 40 minutes up the highway near Virginia Tech. Go Hokies. So if you're a person who is highly personable, well-trained in behavior analysis, and interested in joining a great clinical team as a behavior consultant, please reach out to me at zach at principledbehavior.com. I'll put my email address in the show notes in case you're interested. Dr. Tyra Sellers, hello, and welcome to the Functional Relations Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you both. Dr. Tyra Sellers is a Director of Ethics at the Behavior Analysis Certification Board. Yeah, this is great. Uh, Today we're talking about supervision. So we're really happy that you're joining us because this is obviously an area that you have quite a bit of expertise in. So we're really just thrilled to have you on today. Well, thanks. I don't know if I necessarily have expertise, but I've certainly made a lot of errors and tried to learn from them. So I'm happy happy to share some of those. Experience then. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. In your opinion, what does an effective fieldwork experience look like to ensure that someone's learning all of the things that they need to become a good BCBA? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think it needs to look like whatever it needs to look like for that individual, which feels like a little bit of a cop out. But if oh, you th- definitely did. <laughs> Well, good. I'm glad that we agree on that and you feel comfortable calling me out. But hear me out. I have a a purpose. Um, It's the same way if you were to ask me like, hey, you know, hey, thanks for being on this podcast. We're going to talk about clinical programming for, you know, five-year-olds with autism. Tell me what a a good clinical program would look like for a kid who's five with autism. I would say the same thing. Like it would look like whatever the right program is for that kid. Now, that's, you know, my justification, but um, that does mean that there are components that one should attend to, just like mm. in clinical programming for um, an individual. So, you know, we don't uh, use cookie cutter type approaches, those sorts of things. We don't decide what should happen for another individual. We involve the individual to whatever degree we can. We involve stakeholders. So same thing with appropriate fieldwork supervision creation. You should have the general things that you know are important for all BCBAs, and that might come from the task list and you know the supervisor curriculum 2.0 that the BACB puts out. It may come from your own experience, just knowing what you struggled with as a BCBA or experiencing other folks that have come up alongside you. Um, and it's going to include things like asking your supervisee or trainee what is important to them, finding out how to set up a a relationship that um, is strong and engage in rapport building activities, identify what things are reinforcing for them, identify, you know, what kind of teaching strategies are effective for that individual. So, so yes, it does seem like kind of a cop out, but it's, it's a purposeful cop out. Um, uh, But I will take the opportunity to say that it does require planning and purposeful thought. And it should not only focus on task list items because you've got things like professionalism and time management, organizational skills and problem solving and all of those things that you have to wrap in. So um, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) (laughs) I thought it was a great answer. Perfect. So knowing that, you know, supervision sort of needs to be tailored to the supervisee, I guess you could say, um, are there any systems out there that can be helpful for supervisors to figure out an efficient and effective way to deliver that supervision sort of once they know what their what their goal is? Uh, so, I mean, there are way more supports out there now than there were, say, 10 years ago, five years ago which is great. There are a series of articles that have been published across a few different journals, most notably behavior analysis and practice that would give people, you know, a place to start. Um, There are some that have appendices that include like sample agendas and how to evaluate, you know, skills, things like that. Then there are a series of books available. Um, So Dr. Kazemi and colleagues have a fantastic book. It's actually written for supervisees and trainees 
But as a supervisor, I read it and learned a lot. Actually, the chapter on feedback is one of the best, I think, uh, resources around for, um, you know, taking a purpose, purposeful approach to receiving, delivering, and teaching about feedback. Um, Dr. Britton and um, Matt's Coria have a great book on remote supervision. Um, my colleagues and I recently put a book out around supervisory practices and mentorship, but none of those hit, I think what you're asking about. I think what you're asking about is sort of like, are there sets of curricula available yeah. versus just resources to guide my supervisory practices? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, exactly. Sort of a curriculum as to what should I be doing when I meet with my supervisee? Like, how am I making sure that they're getting all the things done that the task list is asking us to cover as supervisors? Yeah. So I, I do think the resources I mentioned will help with um, that endeavor in terms of, you know, identifying meaningful tasks to work on and arranging them in an organized and planful way. And then I think there's a new book coming out. Dr. Yelema Cruz and colleagues have a, a book that sort of functions like what you're talking about, sort of breaking it down and saying, do this in this order, that sort of thing. Um, I will be honest, as a supervisor, I probably would minimally use those kinds of things only because I have enough experience that I'm going to feel limited. Now, if you're a new supervisor, I 100% think that you should access those the same way when you're new to clinical programming in whatever area you probably go, to, you know, we might go to um, work by Ron Leaf and colleagues to gather some programming ideas for clients, right? So I think it's great to have access to those. If someone is maybe new to supervising right now and they're you know, just starting out and m maybe they're already involved in some supervision, how would they know if what they're doing right now is useful and effective or not? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I think that's an important question for everybody who's supervising, no matter how long you've been doing it. It's an important question, even for me. Um, and it's something we're required to do. We're required to make sure that our supervision is effective. So I think there are a number of ways. I think one way is just sort of how are you feeling about it? How does it feel to you? Do you look forward to your supervisory meetings with your trainees or your supervisors or your supervisees? I mean, um, are you planned? for those meetings? Do you feel competent and comfortable and um, those sorts of things, right? So there's like sort of that initial level of just like, how do I feel about things? Um, then you could ask your trainees and supervisees how they feel about it, which uh, feels pretty obvious. And you can do that in a number of ways. You can do it informally just in your meetings. Um, for example, at the end of uh, every individual meeting that I have, I wrap it up with some version of, you know, um, hey, so how is everything going? Am I doing what I need to be doing for you? Is there something I need to do more of, something I need to do less of? How do I help make you be as effective as you possibly can? And that's an easy way to set the stage for um, kind of lower stakes feedback. You can ask for formal feedback um, in a structured meeting, or you can use a form, um, or you could use anonymous feedback tools if you have enough supervisees or trainees, uh, and you can do that for free. And so that's always a great way. Yeah. Um, and then you should have some specific sort of metrics that you're looking at, right? You should have a list of tasks that you are working on with your trainees or supervisees. And you can take a look at what percentage of the tasks that we have um, tried to cover has that person mastered or mastered in a certain amount of time or maintained over a certain amount of time. Um, how is that individual um, doing with other measurable tasks like getting reports done on time or how quickly can they find materials that I need when I need them to, right? Like I want to see so, so and so's data. Can they efficiently and effectively pull up that? Um, do you have your meetings regularly? Is that person canceling on you a lot or are they late a lot? How engaged are they, right? These are things that we would measure for clients. Um, with whom we work. And so we can do the same thing um, with our supervisees and trainees. And then you can look at, 
more derivative measures, like how are their clients doing? So if you're supposed mm, to be affecting their professionalism and their um, clinical skills, that should be borne out by successes um, for their clients and maybe you know, uh, RBTs that they're also working with or stakeholders that they're working with, maybe they're responsible for um, training parents on some strategies. So you can also get feedback from those more tertiary individuals that are um, related. I don't, I feel like I talked a lot. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I, I agree. Like all the things you mentioned are so important when providing supervision. And I really like the point about recruiting feedback as a supervisor, as you're going through um, your meetings with a supervisee, based on all the things that you just described and how important those are, I think, to providing good supervision, how do you find time to do it all? Like, I think lots of times supervisors are, um, you know, they they probably maybe have a caseload or they have their, their typical job responsibilities. And then they're often providing, you know, this fieldwork supervision as well. Do you have any uh, advice for people that are maybe just becoming supervisors on how to find the time to, to provide this effective supervision that you just described? Um, be kind to yourself because you're not going to find the time to do it all right out of the gate. Like don't expect that you're going to be able to eat the Thanksgiving dinner in one bite. It's not going to happen. Um, because our service delivery model just isn't set up to do that, right? Like supervisory activities for the most part, if you're working in a provider agency, might not be billable to the degree that you want or need to be as effective as you would want to be. So, um, you know, sometimes I I feel guilty talking about supervision. I feel guilty producing the book that we produce to some degree because I worry that I'm setting this expectation that everybody out out of the gate should be performing at this high level as a supervisor. And that is certainly not the message that I want to send. What I want to send is that you should be as bought in to high quality supervision as you are bought into high quality clinical services. Your client is the most important person. And the second most important person is anybody running programs that you are responsible for or anyone for whom you have accepted supervisory sort of um, role. And so the idea isn't to, you know, know everything and be perfect right out of the gate. The idea is just to be constantly reflective and refining your processes and, um, you know, allow your behavior to be shaped. So I think right out of the gate, if people can just value supervision, try to connect with their supervisees and trainees in a meaningful way, you know, develop a, a bi-directional relationship where you're learning just as much as they are, or more sometimes, then I think you're poised to do well. It's going to take you a while to build your chops, just like it takes you a while to build your chops as a clinician. So just be nice to yourself um, and take it slow. Uh, and I think start by focusing on setting up a feedback rich environment and that will um, do you well and behave with integrity. Like if you say you're going to do something, do it, do it even if it's hard. Um, so yeah, don't, don't set the bar too high for yourself right out of the gate. <laughs> that, that's great. It's really smart advice. Uh, I mean, what we can be doing as supervisors can be very simplistic or it can be very advanced and so we're somewhere in the middle and we just want to be kind of have this iterative process where we just get better and better and better. Yeah. But like wherever we start, we just have to start there and accept that and and just move a little bit. I think one of the most valuable things I've learned over the last you know few years is just like, if I can make iterations of what I'm doing right now, basically letting natural selection <laughs> work, <laughs> right? Just put out a lot of stuff. And then the things that are really valuable. We'll just take hold and I'll use those and just don't be too hard on yourself when you do things. Exactly. Like let things go. And that's really smart. Very, very good advice. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Be kind to yourself. Yeah. That's such a good, a good thing. And it seems like one of the things you really f have focused on so far is about building those relationships um, with your supervisee or the people that you're working with. Um, do you find that it's hard to keep a good relationship 
when you're requiring a lot of someone, right? Like we have to require a lot of people as we're working with them because there's a lot of things for them to learn. But what are some tips on how to keep that working relationship uh, smooth and keep things from getting, you know, feeling that you're expecting too much of them? Sure. Um, well, I think the first thing is acknowledging that it it should be, again, a bi-directional relationship, not a, I'm going to ask you to do a bunch of hard stuff and then I'm going to tell you how bad you are at doing it, <laughs> right? Hmm. That's not the idea. Yeah. The idea is that we're coming to this together. Um, we're both going to make mistakes and I have to behave in a way that allows you to trust me because I'm literally asking you to do things that you don't know how to do. Um, and <laughs> some that may have some risk, right? It may, I'm asking you to do something new with a client that could be risky for you in terms of feeling like you're wasting the client's time. Or I'm going to ask you to do something new in front of other staff or parents in, in terms of training. And so um, I think that it needs to be as as much as we can, it needs to be an equal relationship. I get it. There's a power differential right out of the gate, right? We're not going to get around that. Um, But, you know, making sure that you are communicating and sharing some of the effort you put in, you know, talk to your trainees and supervisees about the things that you do to prep for that meeting. Um, If you have a situation where you have an agenda and your supervisee or trainee can put some things on that agenda and you require that two days in advance, you can be clear. I'm asking you to do that because I go into that agenda. I take a look at what you've put on there. And then I have to go to articles and books and make sure that I know what I'm talking about. So I think if you um, can demonstrate the shared effort that goes in, that, um, that that goes a long way. I think having your feedback rich environment means, you know, lots of praise as well as feedback around guiding someone in, into more optimal performance. Um, I think having clear expectations is a no-brainer when it comes to ensuring that you're having a smooth working relationship. And um, and if your feedback, uh, if your trainee or your supervisor gives you feedback, man, you know, like tact that, like, hey, Zach, you know what? Thank you so much for pointing out that I could do that better or that I didn't do that or I need to do that. And I really value that you were brave enough to give me that feedback. And then uh, maybe circle back. Like, remember two weeks ago, Zach, when you gave me that feedback? Like, that was really helpful. And I've been thinking a lot about it. And these are the changes I've made. Have you noticed it? And by the way, I've also implemented that change with my other trainees. And so I, I think, again, like, just being open and honest and sharing the fact that you value their work and their efforts and that, you know, you're, you know, that you're asking them to do difficult things and you're not going to, to the best of your ability, ask them to do something that you aren't there to support them to do and to do well. Um, so. Yeah. seems like just being an authentic person, showing that you put in work, they put in work, you put in uh, your effort, they put in effort and it, and that you've made mistakes and you're still making mistakes and we're all that we're all managing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think hopefully someday gone will be the days of the idea that supervision um, relationships are sort of like, like you trainee come and worship at the altar of my intellect. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> That's not yes, what we right. need or what we want these days. Um, and, uh, and it's not helpful. And like, can you get behavior change that way? Sure. You can get behavior change being a coercive, uh, punishing supervisor, 100%. Um, but the person's probably not going to like it. You're probably not going to get more effective or efficient at what you're doing. And you run the risk of a lot of counter controls, a lot of um, unhappy people, and that person not being well positioned to provide effective supervision um, in the future when they move into a supervisory role. So, Hey, everybody. If you're interested in getting a CE for listening to this episode, This episode is worth one supervision learning CE, and you'll need to provide two code words when you go to checkout. The first code word for this episode is window. 
W I N D O W window. Open up the window and let some fresh air in. Window. Yeah, something um, Zach and I have talked about that I'd love to get your thoughts on is so much of being a behavior analyst, as you well know, is responding to somewhat new situations, I guess, right? So we often encounter situations that are kind of different, but maybe a little bit similar to similar situations, but it often requires problem solving skills to kind of arrive at a solution or a plan of action. So I feel like this is a skill set that obviously has to be developed in somebody that we're supervising. Do you have any suggestions on how to develop this repertoire? Because I mean, it's kind of a complex skill set. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think you start with what you just did, which is describe that that's the goal, right? So um, the idea is to produce behavior analysts at the master's level, not technicians. Technicians just do the things that that are, you know, sort of designed for them to do. Um, but if you're an analyst, you're someone who is able to take stock of all of the stimuli in the environment, the context, you know, sort of derive some functional relations that may be present, make some manipulations, identify, you know, did did you get the outcome that you wanted? Um, and we we train that up in terms of clinical work, great, but it feels like we don't do a great job letting people know that that is a general skill set that you can apply to every aspect of your life. And in fact, you should apply it to supervisory practices. You should apply it to staff training, interacting with parents or other professionals. Um, and so I'll tell you for me, one of the, one of the most important lessons that I learned early on was that I was, I'm not naturally very good at self-observing and tacting what I was attending to and why I engaged in a certain response versus another response. And part of that may be uh, related to kind of what Zach was talking about earlier, which is actually my life motto once I figured out behavior analysis, um, which is just engage in a lot of behavior and let your behavior get shaped, right? Which is great for producing a robust uh, repertoire of responses, but not so great at being able to attend to, well, which response might be most optimal in this situation. Um, and so I really had to work hard to develop that because what would happen is I would do, let's say I was working with a client who had some severe problem behavior and what, whatever I was able to create a situation where ultimately there was uh, no problem behavior and, um, you know, socially appropriate behavior. And someone might ask, and this is back in the day, because I started just as like a one-on-one, -on -one. I started doing respite work. <laughs> so, um, but you know, like a coworker might say like, Hey, what did you do? Like, that was really great. And my response would be like, I don't know. I just did a bunch of stuff and, and it worked, <laughs> which, <laughs> which like, honestly was kind of reinforcing because it's like, I'm just naturally good at this. I follow yeah. my instincts. But that's a really bullshit answer if you're a behavior analyst because it does. it's not fair to the client because I'm not able to say specifically these things produce this result and I can do more of them to get more of that result and I can avoid doing these other things because they get the result I don't want. So that's terrible, right? We don't want to expose clients to trial and error. It terrible for me because I'm not able to identify what was optimal and what wasn't and then replicate that with that person or other people. And it's terrible for my coworkers because I can't say, oh, specifically do X, Y, Z. So I can't systematize things. Um, so it, it's just crappy all around. Uh, <laughs> and so I think forcing yourself to be observant, to be able to tact the, the stimuli in the environment uh, or even internally that you are attending to um, those decision points and why you're able to discriminate. Like in this instance, I can have my laptop out taking notes with this parent, but in this other instance, I tacked it some things that led me to discriminate that I should close my laptop and instead just sit and listen. Right. Um, so attend to those things, start tacting them and then talk those out with your trainees and supervisees. Um, we need to 
teach people how to engage in that skill. And some people are naturally good at it, probably, and others like me are not. But I think walking folks through that, right? Like the idea is that we don't have like a toolkit that we pull out to solve um, problems <laughs> by just plugging it in. It's like we have to attend to all of these different variables. And this is the structured approach we take. Because then you're truly giving someone a skill set that they will be able to use in a robust way in a wide variety of settings and situations versus rule following or prescriptive um, responding. And, um, and then I think also acknowledging that it means you're going to get it wrong sometimes, or you're at least going to get it not as right as you could have. And those aren't bad moments. Those are learning moments. Like, discomfort and mistakes are our teachers. And so lean into those and create an environment where you're combating that common perception that those um, should be punishing or should be avoided at all costs. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great advice. In in um, my company, we, we just hired on a, a new BCBA and this is our first consultant for our company. And so we're trying to develop these sorts of systems. Mm -hmm. And the exact same thing you had mentioned is occurring with me, which is that this person's like, so how do you make decisions about this programming or whatever? And I'm like, you know, I've never really written down exactly how this works, but it's a great, it it's so um, valuable in my opinion to have be going through this process because I get to learn like, what are the things that I'm paying attention to when I'm right. doing this, for lack of a better way, performance? When I'm doing this thing, um, what what are the things that seem to matter? And I may not have been able to tack that at all. Um, so going through that process is pretty interesting and could be really valuable for people um, if they feel like they have a strong skill set in some particular area and they want to teach that skill set to one of their trainees. Yeah, I think when the more fluent you are, sort of the harder it is to do that, like to stop and really think about those yeah. um, decision points. So, but but to your point of problem solving, um, I also think that teaching a structured approach to problem solving is really critical. And I don't care what problem solving approach you use. Uh, Bailey and Birch has um, they have one in their book. Um, Rosenberg and Schwartz have a lovely algorithm in um, an article around ethics decision making um, that could be used for non ethics issues. Um, my co authors and I have one in the book that we recently wrote. But the idea is just to take a structured approach so that you have something to go back to. And also, if you have a structured approach, you can teach that to your trainees. And I like to use a backward chaining model when I'm teaching problem solving. So I'll have a scenario and I walk through each of my steps. And then the next time we'll go through a scenario and I walk through the steps and I have my trainee do the last step. And then the nice. next time I have them do, you know, the last two steps. And so that way they're always contacting optimal responding to get to the step where they're going to have to produce something um, <laughs> yeah. to set them up for success. So that's been a really helpful strategy for me. That's cool. Like the solution as the reinforcer. And yeah, yeah <laughs> that is neat. I like that. That's smart thinking. Yeah. So when we think about the situation that a lot of BCBAs are in, which is that they're being asked to basically provide supervision, but they may have very limited training on how to be a good supervisor I was just wondering if you had any advice for these professionals um, who might be considering becoming a supervisor for the first time. Maybe they're nervous about it. Um, well, I suppose they should be nervous about it the same way <laughs> they probably will be nervous the first time they're taking on clients independently or something like that. So yeah. I think that's a good thing. Like, don't um, assume just because you feel nervous or trepidatious about something that that means you shouldn't do it. If like the way I think about nervousness or maybe like a little bit of anxiety is sort of like, um, it's my brain's warning system. Like something important is happening and um, that you should attend to, right? Like if you're a little nervous before you present, at a conference, that's just your brain doing you a favor of saying like, okay, well, double check. Is your zipper up? Do you have your notes? Like, you know, do you have water? 
Um, and so I think if you're feeling a little nervous, that's totally appropriate. I would be worried if folks didn't feel nervous. Um, and I think that we should tweak your question a little bit because your question was lovely, but it was worded like people that are considering supervising. And I get the sense that most folks don't even have any say in whether or not they're going mm, to supervise Absolutely. Um, either RBTs, obviously, or trainees. Like it may be a requirement oh, as right. part of their job. That's right. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, might feel bad because you also <laughs> yes. may not have control over how many people you're taking on, which is really problematic. Um, so I think one thing that can be quite valuable is to think about your values related to supervision, especially if you have to do it. What is it that you value about the supervisory process? Is it that you value creating an opportunity for intellectual discourse? Is it that you value positioning people to be successful in their careers? But I think if you can articulate those values, it will make it It will at least give you some light at the end of the tunnel to keep an eye on when things are not going well. And that's going to happen. Like they're not going to go well from time to time. Things are going to fall apart. Uh, You know, you're going to say something that offends a trainee or a supervisee, or you're not going to train something optimally, or you're going to feel like this person just isn't getting it or whatever. But if you've connected with your values, you at least can you know, kind of look to those things when reinforcement schedules are thin. Um, So I think that's one thing is identify your values. I think the other thing besides being kind to yourself and understanding that you need to take, you know, a purposeful approach and kind of baby steps and get your behavior shaped, um, build some good support networks for yourself. So pick an organization that has senior clinicians that have a lot of experience supervising who are available to you to help out in difficult situations. Pick an organization that has folks that have supervised for a while who can share things like agendas and curricula or activities with you. Um, Pick an organization maybe that pays $5,000 less on your salary, but gives you robust mentorship or professional development funds or things like that. So we think one thing that folks can do is it's going to be hard and they're not going to do it right the first time, but you can put yourself in a situation where those mistakes will be minimized because you have supports available. Well, that was great. That was, um, that was super helpful, Tyra. Um, do you have any other things that you feel like would be really important for our listeners to to know before we end today? Hmm. Yeah, I think just to summarize, you know, be kind to yourself, be kind to other people, uh, understand that it's more than just the task list. Understand that when you are providing training and supervision, it's not just clinical skill sets that you're building up, but you hopefully are training those individuals how to be effective supervisors um, and trainers in the future. So it's it's a very robust skill set. Um, use the resources that are available out there. You know, some of the books that I mentioned, some of the articles that I mentioned, um, and I don't know. Just just take a deep breath. <laughs> be nice <laughs> to your, I don't. I, I keep coming back to be nice to yourself because I just feel like we put a lot of pressure on folks. Um, in our profession and, um, rightly so, but, you know, also take time to, you know, be healthy and, um, give yourself space to breathe and contact reinforcers. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I really enjoyed hearing all you have to say about supervision and I'm sure our our listeners are really going to appreciate it. So thank you again for coming on the podcast today. Great conversation. Thanks. My pleasure. I could talk about supervision all the time. And I really appreciate the thoughtful questions that you all had prepared. So thank you both. All right. And we're back. Before we talk about our interview that we just had with Dr. Tyra Sellers, we wanted to take a second to thank our Patreon members. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for 
supporting us on Patreon. Patreon is a website that allows listeners to access things like behind the scenes posts, bloopers, updates, and uh, other small gifts that we send to our members to show appreciation. In season three, we're going to be adding in uh, video interviews. So interviews we conduct with the guests on the podcast will be in video form for our Patreon members. You can learn more about becoming a Patreon member at www.patreon.com slash functional relations podcast. We'll leave the link in the show notes if that's something you're interested in. All right. Yeah. So thank you so much, all you Patreon people out there. I thought that was an excellent interview with Dr. Tyrus Sellers. And yes, a lot of little golden nuggets, I think, that she shared <laughs> with us um, yes. about being a supervisor. Was there anything that really stood out to you, Zach? Or I, I know a number of things probably did, but is there anything in particular? Yeah. So there were a number of things that actually stuck out to me, to be honest. A lot of them were things that I think we explained pretty well in the, or that Dr. Sellers explained pretty well in the in the interview. But one thing I w- thought might be interesting to kind of dive deeper on with you, Caleb, was just in passing, Dr. Sellers mentioned that it's important that we involve the supervisee. And I I wanted to kind of ask you, what do you think that means? Like, what are the what are the things that we can do? with our trainees that can involve them and, and and make sure that we're not just telling them that this is the thing you need to do, but really looking at, you know, what is it that they want to accomplish in the supervision experience? Oh uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's a good question, actually. Um, I mean, I think supervision should be a two-way street, right? So it shouldn't just be yes. the supervisor telling the supervisee what they need to do and providing (laughs) feedback to them. You know, it's a shared experience. And I think that understanding as a supervisor, what's important to your trainee and what they want to work on is important, right? There's obviously things that have to get covered in supervision. You gotta, you gotta hit certain um, topics and things like that. But I don't know. I think looking at somebody's preferences, um, seeing what they want to work on and kind of having it be a a shared experience in goal setting. Oh, yeah, that's great. I like the way you kind of put it as goal setting. You could imagine that's one of the first things you do is you're asking your trainees, what are the goals they have for their studying for the exam? But then you might also have other goals that are maybe related to professionalism or related to dealing with difficult situations, kind of some of those soft skills that we need to have as behavior analysts that maybe the trainee feels that those are things they would like to work on too. So just having some way of understanding, maybe through some sort of question asking or maybe an informal assessment to understand what are the things that this person wants to do. Because when you think about it, that means they're going to be motivated to be working on those things, right? There's going to be EO in place for them to get better at those things. And so those will be the easier things to teach if that's the things they really care about. Yeah, no, I I like that. Something else that I think is important is at the onset of the, this two way street relationship is Mm -hmm. And I think we touched upon this in the episode, but I I think it's worth revisiting and talking even more about is creating an environment where your supervisee or trainee feels comfortable giving you feedback. Oh, yeah. And I I think that you might have to you might have to set the occasion by setting aside time where you're specifically asking for feedback, right? Mm Because depending on the trainee, they may be more or less um, like open or comfortable just giving you feedback because essentially you are their supervisor technically. And I think in some ways it's not always a natural thing or something that people feel comfortable with, with giving other people feedback. But I think as a supervisor, really making sure somebody knows that you want feedback, like this is important. Right. You, you're you learning things too, and you need to know um, how things are working for them in your supervisee-supervisor relationship. Yeah, that's a good point. And a trainee will be very sensitive to how you respond if 
you get feedback from them. So for instance, if you are defensive and you have trouble accepting feedback from a supervisee or a trainee, just like at a basic level, then they're going to pick up on that and they're not going to help you get better, essentially. Uh, but if we take a humble approach and we understand that we're all just learning and for sure there are skill sets that the trainee is going to benefit from you know, you as a BCBA who's delivering feedback to them, but also understanding that we're all just doing our best. There's these two ways of looking. One is we can pretend that we're perfect and that we know everything and that's not going to work, to be honest. And then you have this other where you feel like you don't know anything and there's nothing you could offer this person. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle and understanding that is probably a, a good way. So taking a humble approach to that could be really beneficial. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. In the interview, there was a little bit of talk about like individualization, or at least that's a yeah. theme that right. stuck out to me that I think is important. Um, so individualization of the supervision experience. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Sellers sort of related this to, you know, if you're, if somebody was asking, what does an ABA program for a client look like? <laughs> yes. You wouldn't say it's the same thing every time for every client. That, like, that wouldn't make any sense. And I don't right. think any of our listeners would, would think that that makes sense. Supervision is the same way. If you're, if you're training somebody to be a behavior analyst, you wouldn't want to just use the same exact system and not tailor it to the, to the supervisee, right? Like you want to have some flexibility and be open to, to adjusting your method that you feel like so is going to be most so effective for your, the, the trainee. Yeah. So it's not that they're all the same, but that there must be some sort of components that of effective supervision that go across, um, and I know you've done this a lot, Caleb, and this is why I think I want to ask you this question because you've been doing a lot of supervision recently. I wouldn't say a lot, but you've been doing some supervision recently over the last few years and your your trainees have done extremely well when they when it comes to the test. I know you wouldn't want to say this, but these people might be listening, Caleb, and they're so proud that they had you as a supervisor because look at them now. They're all BCBAs. But there must be some effective components to the supervision that as a field, we probably should keep in, in mind. Um, you know, what do you think are the most important things? Or what do you think are, are some important things? So component number one that I feel like is important, and this is coming from my own personal experience. Okay. And I should Everyone, say, and I should say what down. I've seen some, some systems of supervision require that I think is effective is okay. covering definitions and key concepts in behavior analysis and having supervisees create note cards and essentially having them, you know, maybe recite those definitions, providing feedback, coming up with examples that re are related to the work that they do every day. That's component number one in my opinion. Okay. That's a good one. What else? Uh, component number two is covering all the task list items. <laughs> yeah. I know it, I, this feels like it's obvious, but I think that it's difficult. <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of well, task so list many, items. Right? Yeah. Depending on how long, um, you know, you're working with a particular supervisee, it can be difficult, I think, to get in all the task list items. So I think covering all the task list items and I think that having a system of how you're going to do this. Like, I think you need a system. You need to, yeah. if you just kind of go into every meeting talking about whatever you feel like talking about, you're not going to be efficient enough to get through everything you need to get through. And that's my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. That's been my experience too. I've had some, um, some trainees and I agree with that 100%. With that being said, though, I think that there are resources of figuring out how to do that, some of them of which were talked about in the episode. So, I mean, 
my advice to any any new supervisor is if you're going into a training experience and you want to make sure you're covering all the core content, you should probably look to having a system and, and planning about how you're going to pace yourself because that's what else comes into play <laughs> too. It's like, you know, you're going to have X amount of months or meetings with somebody. How am I going to pace myself to get through all this stuff? Right. That's right. Okay. That's two. Get all those task list items under your belt. That's number two. What else we got? Components of effective supervision, according to Caleb Davis. Here we go. Number one, definitions. Number two, contact all the task list items. Number three, what's number three? Number three is you got to do stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, seriously, do stuff. This is another one that seems really straightforward, but your supervisees need to learn how to do stuff, right? So even though I mentioned... (laughs) I just like uh, I just talking like about that, definitions the of- and <laughs> covering task list items. A lot of the task list is doing things. And so making sure that somebody practices skills, they get experience doing the things that are listed on the task list, or maybe from talking to them, they have some things that they want to work on, like professional skills outside of just task list items and figuring out ways for them to work on those skills and receive feedback. So creating opportunities to do stuff and get feedback to mastery. That's, that's the big thing. Yeah. That's great. Or one of the big things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that those are good. So number one, definitions, get some staff meds, make some note cards. That'll help a lot. Also along those lines, Caleb and I are working on developing a few episodes this season, actually around key concepts. So this could be something that could be useful for people as far as um, understanding those key concepts a little bit better. And then number two, contact all task list items. Just uh, do your best. I mean, this is really hard because, you know, we only have a certain amount of time, but that's why, you know, like you said, pacing yourself so that we can actually get them all in in the amount of time you have. That's a great suggestion. And then C, do stuff. Yeah. Basically, I think that's a great suggestion. Just uh, make sure that we can actually behave uh, toward the things that are required when we become a BCBA. That's great. All right. So this was a great episode, Caleb. Thank you for your insight. I, you have a lot of skills in this area. I'm glad that I could talk to you about it. And um, I'm gl- so glad we could talk to Dr. Tyra Sellers about it too. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Caleb, we should be keeping in mind before we close out the episode? Hey, everyone, if you've been listening to this whole episode and you're interested in getting a supervision CE, the second and final code word is smell. S-M-E-L-L. What is that smell? Smell. When you finish the episode, head over to functionalrelationspodcast.com to purchase your supervision CE. And also, if you're in need of ethics CEs, you can get two ethics CEs for any of our episodes from season one, or you could get one learning CE from any of our episodes from season two. I don't think so. This was a fun one. It was really great talking about supervision with Dr. Sellers. Really, really thankful that she could come on and talk to us about this today. Um, Really enjoyed it. Yeah. So I guess in the end, I would summarize by saying, be kind to yourself. After you listen to an episode like this, you might think, oh man, I got, I, I suck. I got to do better. We all should understand we don't need to be perfect, but we should be putting ourselves in a position to be always improving. And um, we are going to put some books, articles, and other resources in the show notes for you to check out. Hopefully that will be helpful. And uh, next time you hear from us, Episode two will be actually for the trainees, for the students who are studying for the exam. Maybe they want to jump in on a key concept that we have outlined for next episode. That'll be in two weeks. So thank you for listening and we will see you next time. Yeah.